Welcome dear viewers to the Fadri Stories channel. Today we're delving deep into a spine-chilling case set in the small town of Amityville, located in Long Island, New York. Standing tall in this quaint town is a stoic house at 112 Ocean Avenue. Despite its outward beauty and charm, this house harbors a dark secret, a secret that is about to unravel in the most terrifying way possible. Get ready, as we explore the mysteries hidden within the walls of this enigmatic residence. That inspired dozens of books and movies, a story full of terror and sleepless nights. It is the story of an unloved child, with murderous intent, and a paranormal tale that walks the thin line between fact and fiction. This is the true story of the Amityville house hauntings. Let's get into it. The Amityville haunting is a notorious tale, a tale that has been recounted time and time again. Regardless of your belief in it, the narrative is rooted in reality. However, to comprehend the genuine account, we must rewind to the inception. In 1974, the Amityville house belonged to the DeFeo family. Ronald DeFeo Sr. and his wife, Louise, resided in the house with their five children. Their eldest, Ronald DeFeo Jr., commonly known by the nicknames Butch or Ronnie, Don, their 18-year-old daughter, Allison, 13-year-old Don, and their youngest children, Mark, 12, and John Matthew, 9. Until this juncture, the family had weathered a tumultuous existence. Ronald Sr. was a commanding figure, exhibiting overbearing behavior towards the children. As they matured, their fear and resentment toward him intensified. Ronnie, in particular, faced significant challenges. Despite seeking support from his mother, Louise remained silent on the issue. Frustrated and angered, Ronnie developed into a troubled teenager. He resorted to drugs and alcohol in an attempt to alleviate the pain, but his anger never truly abated. Ronald Sr. and Louise attempted to pacify Ronnie with money and gifts, but it appeared to only exacerbate his eccentric behaviors. As the years went by, he became entangled with even more potent drugs. Eventually, Ron Sr. arranged for him a position at the dealership where he was employed. Despite Ronnie consistently leaving early and arriving late, he managed to retain the job with his father's assistance. Despite his parents' efforts to quell his erratic conduct, Ronnie descended into aggressive patterns and began physically lashing out at the rest of his family. At one juncture, he even brandished a gun, threatening Ronald Sr. unbeknownst to anyone at that moment. This incident would later prompt the townspeople to ponder a tragedy yet to unfold. It was a chilly day on November 14, 1974. At 6.30 in the evening, the bar crowd was just assembling. It came as a shock to everyone when a distressed and shouting Ronnie DeFeo entered the bar that day. He asserted that someone had broken into his home and he feared his parents were dead. Those at the bar trailed Ronnie back to the Ocean Avenue house where they made the gruesome discovery of his family. Every member of the DeFeo family had been brutally murdered in their beds. In a state of shock and disbelief, the local police department was summoned. However, when the police eventually arrived at the scene, they did not search for the intruder Ronnie claimed had been present. Instead, they promptly deemed Ronnie's account suspicious. As they navigated through the house, they discovered that each member of the DeFeo family had been shot. While they were sleeping in their beds, each one lay on their stomach, faces down, hands clasped behind their backs. There was no indication of a struggle, no trace of a break-in or robbery. When the police presented Ronnie with this evidence, his narrative swiftly began to unravel. Initially, he accused Mafia hitman Louis Fellini. Then, he shifted the blame to his sister Dawn, claiming she had slain the family. And he shot Dawn. Gradually, his narrative evolved until he finally admitted, and the truth emerged. On the night of November 13th at 3.15 a.m., Ronnie reached a breaking point. He calmly rose from his bed and seized his 35 Marlin rifle. Stealthily, he entered his parents' bedroom and discharged two shots into each of them as they slept. Subsequently, he systematically moved through his siblings' rooms, shooting each one at close range where they lay. The horrifying act unfolded in a mere 15 minutes. After completing the grim task, Ronnie showered, dressed for work, and concealed all traces of his crimes in a pillowcase, which he later discarded into a storm drain on his way to work. He maintained his facade while at work, 
and when his father failed to appear for his shift, Ronnie feigned making a call home to ascertain the reason for his father's absence. To establish an alibi, he informed his co-workers and everyone he encountered that day that he was unable to reach his family. At around noon, he left work, a routine action for Ronnie that raised no suspicions. The next instance anyone laid eyes on him, he was rushing into the bar, screaming for help. As the police commenced their interrogation to comprehend the motive behind his heinous act, Ronnie quickly succumbed. He was quoted as saying, Once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. Interestingly, when questioned, none of the neighbors claimed to have heard gunshots that night, only the sound of the DeFeo's dog barking. Upon examining the weapon, police concluded that the gun's barrel was not equipped with a silencer, and no sedatives had been administered to the family. Both were aspects they had anticipated. Ronald DeFeo Jr. was apprehended and charged with six counts of first-degree murder. DeFeo enlisted lawyer William Weber as his counsel, who believed that the only viable defense strategy was to plead insanity. He asserted that Ronnie heard voices on the night he carried out the murders, voices instructing him to kill his entire family. DeFeo underwent psychiatric evaluations, and while the psychiatrists acknowledged that he did suffer from some form of mental illness, they determined that he was fully cognizant of his actions and knew that what he was doing was wrong. His trial commenced nearly a year later in October of 1975. He was convicted on all six counts of murder and received six consecutive life sentences. The residence at 112 Ocean Avenue stayed vacant for 13 months following the brutal murders. It stood empty and shrouded in darkness, a chilling reminder of the atrocious crimes perpetrated within. For a period it appeared that no one inclined to inhabit the home on Ocean Avenue, that is, until George and Kathy Lutz acquired the property in December of 1975. Just 28 days later, they would hastily leave the premises, fearing for their lives. George and Kathy, newlyweds, had a blissful blended family. They bought the house for themselves and their three children at an excellent price. Despite numerous assertions that they were facing financial challenges, the couple believed they could handle their expenses along with the new mortgage. Initially, everything appeared to be in order, but shortly after moving into the house, all family members began to encounter unsettling paranormal occurrences. Soon after settling in, George started hearing voices and knocking noises throughout the house. He asserted that doors would open and slam shut on their own. Kathy Lutz asserted discovering a room that was not indicated on any of the house plans, and most disturbingly, the room was painted in a shade of blood red. Then came the fateful night when things shifted from strange to downright terrifying. At 3.15 a.m., George Lutz woke up, glancing at the clock with growing frustration. Every night since they had relocated to their new residence, he consistently woke up at exactly 3.15 a.m. Unbeknownst to him, 3.15 a.m. was the precise time when Ronald DeFeo Jr. had awakened to commit the murders. George considered the possibility that it might be the stress of moving or perhaps the challenge of adapting to the new house. He attempted to rationalize it, although it became increasingly difficult to do so. On this particular night, as he turned over to sleep, he witnessed something inexplicable. George observed his wife, Kathy, seemingly levitating just above the bed. As astonishing as this sight was, it marked only the commencement of a sequence of horrifying events that would afflict the Lutz family. Soon, the haunting seemed to intensify. Among the horrors the Lutzes claimed to have experienced included ghostly shadows appearing inside the home when it was empty, two of their sons seemingly levitating over their beds, an infestation of flies in the house during the winter, green slime oozing from the walls and keyholes, the apparition of a pig with red glowing eyes staring at them from a window, and knives autonomously flying off the kitchen counters. As the days went by, the family asserted experiencing peculiar odors and mentioned feeling randomly occurring ice-cold spots throughout the home. Rapidly becoming uneasy with the haunting sensations, George and Kathy determined it was time to seek professional assistance. They summoned a priest, Father Pecorero, to come and bless the home. Father Pecorero traversed the house, blessing each room along the way. However, he departed hastily before completing the task, asserting that he heard voices instructing him to leave. 
The priest urged the family to take a break from the house and recommended staying with a family member or friend. Exhausted and desperate, the Lutzes concurred, and that night they abandoned the house, declaring to anyone who would listen that they were tormented by malevolent forces. George Lutz proclaimed they had departed due to their apprehension for their family's safety. After enduring 28 days of living in torment, they sought refuge at a family member's house and never came back. Despite the gripping narrative the Lutzes shared, many remained skeptical. The Lutzes refrained from providing intricate details about the sinister forces they believed were haunting them. During interviews, they appeared hesitant to delve into the matter. Some individuals who knew the family asserted that their account was entirely fabricated. William Weber, their former attorney, alleged that the three of them had fabricated the story over wine and that the entire narrative was a concoction aimed at aiding the Lutzes in escaping their overwhelming debt. The Lutzes, however, remained steadfast in their account. They insisted that the hauntings indeed took place, and they went to the extent of undergoing a lead detector test to substantiate their truthfulness, which they successfully passed. Even their children were unwavering in asserting that they had experienced haunting events while in the home. Their son Daniel stated that he had been possessed by a spirit, and went so far as to claim that his life had been ruined by living in that house during those 28 ominous days. Eventually, George and Kathy struck an agreement with Jay Anson, the author who would eventually chronicle their experiences in the house. Despite their initial attorney, William Weber, playing a role in convincing the Lutzes to consider publishing their story, he was ultimately excluded from any financial arrangements related to the story. In return, Weber stated that his sole intention was to use the story to secure another trial for Ronnie DeFeo. Despite the absence of another trial, the Lutzes garnered significant profits from their haunting story, raising doubts about its authenticity. While George and Kathy have since passed away, their children steadfastly maintain that they endured genuine horrors at their residence on Ocean Avenue. Nonetheless, Kathy's son from her previous relationship, Christopher Quarantino, later introduced an intriguing element to the haunting narrative. Quarantino asserted that the hauntings were indeed real, but attributed them not to residing in the Ocean Avenue house, but to George Lutz's involvement in occult practices. He explained that George had a keen interest in the paranormal, and aware of the gruesome deaths of the DeFeos in the house, he tried to prompt the spirits to materialize. I wouldn't exactly label it as black magic, but it was a method to summon spirits. Quarantino detailed the chanting he heard from George and went as far as to label George as the catalyst and provocateur of the hauntings his family endured. Despite the notoriety of 112 Ocean Avenue, you won't locate the former DeFeo residence there if you seek it. The address was altered from 112 to 108 years ago in an attempt to discourage crowds from congregating on and around the property. The house has subsequently been owned by several other families, none of whom have reported experiencing any paranormal activities, since the Lutzes made their claims public. Numerous books, articles, and films have been produced revolving around the events they allege took place in the house. The successful movie, The Amityville Horror, featuring James Brolin and Margot Kidder, garnered widespread acclaim upon its release in 1979. It served as inspiration for over a dozen other movies with variations of the same narrative. Although the story has undergone slight alterations over the years, the details often remain the same. What appears most consistent, though, is that the memory of the haunting may be more terrifying than the story itself. So, was the Amityville house really haunted? We'll leave that for you to decide. Subscribe if you're interested in more creepy videos.